On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, which became the Earth's first artificial satellite and represented a significant propaganda victory for the communist state. In the United States, scientists and politicians reacted with alarm. Edward Teller, the co-developer of the hydrogen bomb, declared on national television that the United States had lost a battle more important and greater than Pearl Harbor. During this time, Soviet missile and space activities had already been the subject of numerous intelligence missions by the CIA and other organizations. As the Soviet Union's activity in space expanded, the U.S. intelligence community increased attention and resources on its space effort, whether military or scientific. These intelligence missions were launched to have an impact in a number of areas, from operational security for classified U.S. activities, such as those at Area 51, to planning intelligence collection against Soviet space activities, such as their secret deep space signals suspected to be active communication with extraterrestrial life. On December 5th, 1962, the Director of Central Intelligence published the first of a series of specially focused national intelligence estimates titled the Soviet Space Program. The initial estimate covered topics such as aims and achievements to date, Soviet spaceflight programs, future objectives and capabilities, and probable magnitude of the Soviet effort. Similar estimates of the Soviet space program with the same title followed many times between 1965 and 85. For 20 years, the U.S. was able to closely follow the growing Soviet space program and increase the U.S. intelligence capabilities to monitor and understand such activities. During the Cold War, U.S. intelligence was deeply concerned about the Soviet Union's potential to place nuclear weapons in orbit, a capability that would have dramatically shifted the global strategic balance. The National Intelligence Estimates, or NIEs, in short, particularly one from July 1963, focused on this issue, analyzing Soviet capabilities for launching nuclear-armed satellites and assessing potential launch systems, warhead yields, and cost considerations. This estimate scrutinized the dual-use potential of Soviet space technology, which included advanced reconnaissance satellites and systems capable of detecting missile launches and nuclear detonations. The primary concern was the escalation of space militarization, giving the Soviets a significant strategic advantage. However, the NIE concluded that there was no immediate evidence of the USSR planning to deploy nuclear-armed satellites or establishing an orbital bombardment capability. This finding, while somewhat reassuring, didn't fully alleviate U.S. concerns about the broader implications of nuclear weapons in space, highlighting the tense and cautious atmosphere of the Cold War era. The U.S. intelligence community, particularly through the National Intelligence Estimates, heavily relied on detailed reports about various facets of the Soviet space program, including their ground facilities. A significant 1980 CIA report utilizing satellite imagery detailed developments at six key Soviet space research institutes. This demonstrated the growing U.S. reliance on technological means for intelligence gathering. One of the most critical sites was the Baikonur Launch Complex in Kazakhstan. Known officially by a different name to obscure its location for security reasons, Baikonur was central to Soviet space activities. The U.S. also closely monitored other facilities, like the Simferopol Earth Satellite Tracking and Communication Center, identified in a 1964 report as crucial for tracking space objects. A 1965 CIA analysis focused on high-power tracking facilities at Tyuratam, Kapustin Yar, and Plesetsk. These centers, critical for launches and monitoring space vehicles, were routinely observed through various means, including satellite imagery and communications intelligence. Notably, the U.S. also leveraged unconventional sources, such as analyzing Soviet documentary films to gain insights into their manned spaceflight operations. 
demonstrating the diverse methods employed to maintain surveillance of Soviet space capabilities. Many Soviet space missions were assigned the mission name of Cosmos in an attempt to obscure their purpose, although orbital parameters and launch sites provided significant information to intelligence analysts. An article written in 1967 and published a lot later in the CIA's Studies in Intelligence discussed how analysts were also able to employ the specifics of the Soviet Union's own announcements to determine spacecraft missions. However, one mission that proved difficult for analysts to understand was the Cosmos 57 flight of February 12, 1965. Another account in Studies in Intelligence explained how analysts employing radar data and telemetry intelligence were eventually able to determine that the mission was a test of an automated system that operated the airlock a cosmonaut needed to pass through to conduct a spacewalk. Over 20 years later, another Cosmos mission, 954, would become a major focus of those in the intelligence community and military who monitored and analyzed Soviet space operations. The concern was not determining its objective, conducting ocean surveillance, but where parts of the satellite, equipped with a nuclear reactor, would crash into the Earth's surface. The remains of the spacecraft landed in Canada's Northwest Territories in late January 1977. The crash on the territory of an American ally meant that the U.S. could examine debris from the spacecraft rather than relying solely on remotely collected data. One product of the material exploitation effort was an analysis conducted at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which focused on the fuel employed by the spacecraft's reactor. One component of the so-called signals intelligence was an antenna located at Cagnew Station, Ethiopia, codenamed Stonehouse, that operated from 1965 to 75. Its targets included the Luna 9 mission, which became the first spacecraft to achieve a survivable landing on a celestial body, the Moon, on 3rd of February, 1966. The broader signals intelligence effort to support space surveillance is described in an NSA cryptologic history, which covers the background of the program. The article reports that in addition to the Stonehouse antenna at Cagnew, there was a second antenna system designated Bay House. Other signals intelligence facilities used to monitor the Soviet space program were located in Pakistan, Japan, Turkey, and Norway. The value of space systems to both the United States and Soviet Union resulted in each nation being concerned about the consequences of the failure of such systems. In addition to normal satellite failures, there was concern about active measures taken to destroy satellites or prevent them from functioning properly. Such measures could include interference, jamming, sending false signals, or even a physical assault on the satellites launched from ground, air, or space. Both nations conducted significant experimental efforts with regard to anti-satellite systems and monitored each other's efforts. A 1978 assessment conducted by the Air Force Systems Command Foreign Technology Division focused on Soviet anti-satellite weapons capabilities. It examined the Soviet Union's capability to damage satellites with lasers or neutral particle beams. The assessment concluded that the Soviets have demonstrated a well-funded directed energy program, and it is probable that anti-satellite weapons applications will be among the earliest missions considered. Just five years later, the CIA examined the Soviet ability to defend its satellites against the U.S. anti-satellite weapons system in development. The air-launched miniature vehicle that was scheduled to be deployed in 1987. CIA analysts believed that the Soviets would have only a limited capability to defend their satellites against an attack. As a result, the U.S. system, if deployed, would be capable of attacking low-altitude satellites including most of the Soviet reconnaissance satellites. A 1978 article in Studies in Intelligence reported that, for nearly 16 years, the Soviet Union has been using a deep space link that we have been unable to stop. The U.S. intelligence efforts 
first led to a conviction that the link exists, then to a knowledge of many other aspects of the Soviet planetary program, and finally to a determined but still unsuccessful effort to find the unknown signal. At the time, there was suspicion that the Soviets could be communicating with extraterrestrial life. However, on 9th of November 1983, two Soviet spacecraft in orbit around the planet Venus began transmitting at five centimeter wavelengths. And for the first time, the US intelligence intercepted the signal. The US intercept stations only had a short window to intercept the signal being sent to the Soviet's Crimea control station and the CIA had tried to assist in discovery of the signal's frequency by sending hardware specialists to visit displays of Soviet satellites at international space expositions in Paris and Los Angeles. An article also provided more information on the specific equipment employed in the search effort for the signal. For example, a radio frequency interference van that could monitor 64,000 radio channels simultaneously. Shortly after midnight on November 9th, 1983, a teletypewriter spit out a message that began with, we have it. The rise of Mikhail Gorbachev as the Soviet Union's general secretary in 1985 marked a shift in US-Soviet relations. Yet the Soviet space program continued to be a key focus of US intelligence. In 1986, the CIA reported on the development of over 120 Soviet military systems, many expected to be operational by the mid-1990s, underscoring the ongoing strategic significance of Soviet military advancements. By 1988, the CIA's focus shifted slightly, examining the Soviet space program's pursuit of international prestige through ambitious scientific missions in astronomy, lunar and planetary exploration, solar terrestrial physics, and biomedical research. Concurrently, the CIA assessed Soviet efforts in developing reusable space systems, specifically a space shuttle and a space plane, evaluating their potential military applications. The space plane, with its maneuverability, was noted for its possible use in rapid reaction reconnaissance. The agency also explored a potential Soviet manned Mars mission, planned for after the year 2000. This assessment highlighted the Soviet ambition in space exploration, despite the absence of official funding and amidst a changing political landscape. In 1990, reflecting the Soviet Union's changing policies and economic challenges, the CIA analyzed the Soviet sale of high-resolution satellite images. This contrasted sharply with earlier Soviet attempts at secrecy regarding their reconnaissance satellites. The following year, a CIA assessment emphasized the strength of the Soviet space transportation systems, suggesting that economic pressures might drive the Soviets to sell these technologies to the West and seek joint development opportunities. Overall, these assessments from the late 1980s and early 1990s illustrate how the U.S. intelligence community adapted its focus in response to the evolving dynamics of the Soviet space program against the backdrop of significant political and economic changes within the Soviet Union. The Soviet space program is a really interesting topic. Let me know your thoughts about this video down in the comments and feel free to share if you have any ideas for my new videos. If you think this video deserves a like, please click the thumbs up button and also subscribe to Nebulix. Continue watching my other related videos by clicking on your screen now.